Amazing to be back at Slush. Thank you for not having had lunch yet, having had lunch already, so you can be here for this great session. Now, as many of you know, Europe is not quite as united as we all hope it is in many ways, including when it comes to building and growing a company. And we're talking about the hurdles that exist and the bright ideas out there for how we can make them go away in the future. So Andreas, tell us about, let's kick off talking about EU Inc. What is this idea? How's it going so far, the movement? So very simply, um, we want to create a standard legal entity for all startups in Europe. And just to quickly explain why, uh, we looked at the data uh, in Europe, less than 18% of all early stage investments are pan-European. Or differently put, if you're a founder here and you struggle to raise your first round, it's not just you. In reality, most investors are only investing in their own countries. And unless you have a lot of investors locally, you're pretty much screwed. So to some extent, there is no European startup ecosystem. We are not competing globally as Europe. We are competing as national silos. And the number one fix to change this, like the easiest fix to change this, is by having one standard legal entity that founders can use, investors and their lawyers know, and everybody can just like create standard process and documents around. Um, most startups here know that, and because of that, they're using currently like solutions like the Delaware Inc., for example. And Europe doesn't have an alternative. So essentially, because of this, we are artificially limiting ourselves. We're basically isolating ourselves in silos. And you've set up a petition. Yeah. You've got how many? Tens of thousands? Yeah, how yeah. many people have signed it so we, far? Uh, pretty much the top tier of all uh, founders and investors in Europe, and including many people in this room, signed. And we are like still, like, we please ask still for your signatures, eu-inc.org. Uh, uh, Co-signatories are people like Patrick Collision of Stripe, uh, Paul Graham of Y Combinator, the founders of Wise, Bold, Wold, uh, Niklas Sandstrom, like pretty much any person you can come up with in Europe is so far has been for this. If you're against this idea, please talk to me afterwards. I want to understand your reasoning and explain you my point of view. But like so far, everybody I talked in the ecosystem wants this to happen. Aura, from your point And it shouldn't be that hard. Or? <laughs> I wish, I wish, I wish. So I don't want to be a party pooper, I, but I definitely will be. We had a similar uh, proposal 2004. I was in the army back in the days, like 20 years ago, and we had this proposal in the European Commission. As you know, the European Commission is the one putting these proposals out there, and then there is the European Parliament that makes this proposal as a Christmas tree, and then there is the European Council who will block it, or they try to then implement it the different ways in a different member states. I'm sorry that it's a, uh, it's a gloomy picture of the EU regulation. And I'm all for this initiative. Don't get me wrong. I will do my utmost best to make that happen. I'm part of the European Parliament, so the one institution that normally makes it as a Christmas tree. But I, I try to simplify this time. Because as you know, the new commission is now starting, maybe next week or then a uh, month after. Uh, it depends on the Christmas tree, how long we are blocking them. But the thing is that we need to hold the new commission accountable that they will not propose any more regulation, right? They will streamline, they will harmonize uh, and standard, uh, standardization is the key here, as we agree. But also they need to take this kind of initiatives uh, and make it reality. There is now hope because we will have a Finnish commissioner and Irish commissioner teaming up and we have a quite good MEPs uh, also in the Christmas tree trying to make this happen. But I wouldn't hold my breath yet. We need all of you to lobby heavily your MEPs and your MPs at the national level to make this happen. So what I'm hearing, it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> I hope so. Let's team up there. But actually, it's not straightforward, to be honest. The commission proposes. Then it goes uh, out there to the parliament and to the council, 27 member states, 700 MEPs, all my dear colleagues. 
and we all need to agree at some point. So, wish us luck to make that happen. So Andreas, what, what actually are your next steps? At the moment, if you're, if you're into it, sign yeah. the petition. So, what, what happens next? What are the next stages? Uh, the way we think of it is essentially multiple steps. Number one step was clarity. So just saying, like, here's a very specific solution. No bells and whistles, no muddiness, no additional fundings or anything. Here's a clean solution that can be implemented. Uh, number two is uh, creating a sense of uh, urgency. And for this, we launched a petition to show like the whole ecosystem is behind this. Step three, um, now, that's a crazy thing. I personally, I don't know which one is crazier, the fact that we are trying to change European law or that it actually looks like it's going to happen. You know? So I don't know which one is crazier. But like now, we are actually managed to get to the point where the European Commission at least agrees that this is an important topic. The 20th regime is now part of their actual work for the next years. So this is like the first step. So urgency happened. Like this is happening. This is going to happen as, a, as their work. But now the question is, will it be a correct solution? And like you call it the Christmas tree. I call it like SE and like other multiple other things that were GDPR and like you name it. Um, the question is like, will they implement something that's actually useful for the startup ecosystem? And that's not that easy. Like one of the biggest learnings I had that most politicians uh, have as, a, as an issue essentially, like hundreds of industries coming to them, hundreds of people out of this industry telling them all kinds of different stuff. You know, and they need to filter what actually is working and so on and so on. And they can't just like, they don't, it, it's differently put, Christmas Eve, very complex process. So you know? or how does Andreas make this the number one top priority when it comes to Europe's growth agenda? So we met uh, a month ago in Brussels. I was talking in one event and he came to me and he was literally saying that Aura, we need to meet, meet because we need to make this happen. Now we are here after four weeks talking to all you. I have been approaching in the meanwhile while over 50 policymakers that actually can make the change. But one thing I would encourage you to do is that remember that politics is, I, no matter how boring it might be, and the Brussels bubble can seem like unreachable at some point, but we are real people behind all these regulations. So please reach out and bring us your challenges. Because as he said, I am approached by, let's say, 50 companies per day in Brussels, and then I need to find the common nominator. You are telling me your problem, you are telling me your problem, and you are telling me your problem. But what are they saying? I have identified four things. First, we don't have enough risk capital in the EU. I'm talking about plus 30 million quickly to 10 to 15 years uh, to grow your uh, more risk projects. Okay, I hear you. I've heard this from all over Europe. Second thing, we are over-regulating this market. We have copyright, GDPR, Data Act, Data Governance Act, DSI, DMA, DMA. Only came the last five years or eight years from the Commission, from the uh, Parliament, from the Council. Come on, guys. How you are navigating this jungle of regulation in the EU? Good luck of growing your company. Then one thing, we have only 4% of Europeans living and working in another country where you are originally from. Guys, move if you have a good company in Spain or in Luxembourg or, or even come to Finland. It's not such a bad place. So I'd say that we need to fix all these things. But I need to find the common nominators from you guys so I understand what is actually the problem. And here is one problem. When you enter to this market, you are still facing 27 different cooperative laws, right? So let's find this common solution, but we need all of you to do that. What is the most, for anyone here who has a different issue to the ones we've talked about already, what is the most effective way to work with MEPs, to lobby them? Is it, I mean, it sounds to me like what you're saying is don't go as an individual, like start a movement, work with a lobby group. Like what, what's your advice to someone here who has something that they want to change? Can I tell you one example? I used to work for one big bad tech company, Meta. Oh, it used to be Facebook when I went there. Before that, I was six years in the European Commission, so in the heart of the bureaucrats in, in, in Brussels. So the Commission is proposing the laws, but they are not a lawmaker. Parliament and the member states are. So I knew the game, how it is and how these bureaucrats think. So one thing that they bragged about when they were writing all this digital regulation for me was that, oh, I have never used Instagram. I have never used Twitter. I have never used uh, Blue F. But you are the ones who are regulating these platforms? Really, guys? 
And I knew that. But then I made a mistake when I was working at Facebook, when the DMA, the Digital Markets Act, was coming into a force and we needed to implement that. I brought the best possible engineers from Silicon Valley to talk with these guys in Brussels. My God, they didn't speak the same language, right? And it's not their broken English like mine. The thing was that these engineers, were, where they were actually talking about technology and the business model, how it functions. And then these bureaucrats were like, yeah, 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 but my daughter is sending messages on that blue uh, Facebook and it's really bad because they are getting bad, bad posts there. So come on, how do you regulate if you don't know what you are regulating? So this is a problem in Brussels. So that's why we need guys like him who can explain the real world to these people. And then we need also MEPs, I think, that have worked in the real world, in the private sector. It's not such a bad thing that people have done something else than being in politics, right? But you need to bring these examples to Brussels to us to know what are the problems. And that's what these guys are doing. So, so another successful kind of lobbying, or maybe the most successful lobbying of the EU has been the non, not optional campaign, which changed um, lots of the stock options. What did you, I imagine you've spoken to those guys, what did you learn from them? What was successful so, about that? The, um, um, the people behind not optional, like Wojciech and like his team, are actually part of our core team. So like, the way we think of this is not optional, is the bottoms up approach. You, you try to convince every member state handhold every politician, explain all the little differences, and then they still do like all kinds of differences and like mistakes and whatever. But it will never be the same, unfortunately. U Inc. is a top-down approach. So you have like a, a separate standard law that they can use, like a separate entity they can use, and separate regulations around that for stock options. So ideally, uh, these two go hand, hand in hand on the long run. Um, and uh, ideally, like the EU Inc. becomes like a platform for solutions like stock options or ultimately maybe like even IPOs and on multiple other issues we have here. So what, what happens in your vision, what would happen day one, EU Inc, like the lawyers have worked on it, it exists, like what, what does it actually involve from the start? So the, the way we think of it is, um, just to give it a quick context how we imagine this to work, um, a small subset of corporate law is set on EU level. And that corporate part of corporate law is mainly about the cap table, shareholders, investors, founders, stock options, this kind of part. You still have an office in your member state. You still have a German HQ. You still run your revenue there. You still do employments through member states. So taxes and revenue still have more member state level. Not because we think that's the most convenient or the most European, but like that's how reality is. Member states care about taxes, employer protection, all this kind of stuff. So like this is essentially a compromise. Um, there's one centralized registry, like one EU registry, that you can go and register your company fully digital. This registry is API first. So ideally, there's multiple third party providers who add more and more convenience to this, like connect with a bank account, connect with your investors, and all this kind of stuff. Additionally, uh, there will be standard documents. So the equivalent of a YC safe, we call it the EU fast, uh, will be part of a standard document. The big advantage here is like currently, if I'm a uh, Finnish founder, and for example, if a Finnish founder comes to me and I have a Finnish entity, I have, I have no idea about Finnish anything. You know? I won't look for a lawyer in your country just to figure out this one deal. This is not worth, like, this is not worth nobody's time. If it's one standard, I have done this like multiple times. My lawyers have done this multiple times. We can just like sign instantly. You send me an email with an EU fast, I click a button, I have signed, I have, and I can wire you the money. That's the ideal goal. Additionally, we want to introduce e EO ESOP, so basically stock options uh, uh, defined for the EO Inc. So would these, so if I was setting up a new company in France, yeah. I would just, just set up an EU Inc. I wouldn't yes. set up like a French yes. HQ. The idea is that you have an EO Inc. Yeah. And from that point, you would define a headquarter. And uh, from that point, you would have your company. Like, so think of, for example, if you use tools like Stripe Atlas, think of this experience, but within Europe as an alternative to the Delivery Inc. How hard do you think it would be to get people to adopt that? Very easy. That's the easiest part. Aura? That's the has easiest something part. Something to say? No, no. <laughs> Honestly, like, that's the easiest part. Like, because it, it, it shows, like, if you go to, for example, uh, Eastern Europe, like, it, we like, you know, Nordics, Western Europe is a little bit privileged. Like, we think our local market with the GDP of a computer game and the population of an 
I don't know, Indian village, you know, is like important enough. We think that and we expect that people go to like a GmbH signature thing and like one of the elders of your community comes, sings to you your shareholder agreement for one hour, that's called a notary. And you do all this process because that's how you do things in Western Europe, right? If you go to Eastern Europe, they all use Delivery Inc. Uh, Startup Hungary actually did a study on this. Um, more than half, I think like 60%, either have a Delivery Inc. or want a Delivery Inc. And if you go to companies that have actually raised more, like uh, Series A and Plus, all of them. So like the reality is already that they go and want like this kind of standardization. So founders are in, investors, investors are the first to be in. It's, it's everything easier. This removes like a fifth of my job, you know? Everything easier. So the ecosystem is in. Like if we have this tomorrow, and no pressure, if we have this tomorrow, th th I would accept extremely fast adoption. But I'm sorry, but Irish government is not in. In Luxembourg, they will definitely not be in. So yes, it might be that we are all in, but we need to convince 27 different member states and their politicians. We need to convince 700 MEPs. So it's in a long run, but we can only make it happen if we push hard and give these examples how it will benefit Europe's competitiveness, prosperity, how many jobs it will create. Those are the things how we will lobby this. But the thing is that it's not so easy because you need to touch uh, corporative law. And I give you an example of the Capital Markets Union, which we need, and we have been, we have been working on that like 15 years now. Everyone agrees that we need to have a Capital Markets Union. Prime Minister of Finland is saying in his speeches that, oh, I'm strongly supporting of Capital Markets Union. Okay, Petteri Orpo, are you ready to change the insolvency law in Finland? Oh, no, 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 we are not touching that. Are you ready to harmonize taxation? Oh, absolutely not. That's not in the competence of the EU. So. What are you actually ready to do? Are you ready to open uh, pension funds in Finland? Because most of the funds in Europe are in pension funds. Are you ready to open that in Luxembourg, in Romania, in Sweden? Are you ready? No, 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 we are not touching pension funds. If you are not touching insolvency law, harmonizing taxation or pension funds, how do you actually create a capital markets union? So stop giving these big speeches if you cannot actually act and implement. So here I would say that, yeah, if you want to have this kind of a model that our companies can enter to the whole market, then you need to act and then you need to implement. But it is in the long run and there we need politicians to be ready, not only the stakeholders or companies, but actually MEPs and, and, and members of the national parliaments. Again, sounds easy and straightforward to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean... So, what, sorry, like, just like one thing I real... So first of all, I'm not a policy person and like, please take me by my word if I'm still working in policy like in a small amount of years, I'm not saying any number because otherwise she thinks I'm completely unrealistic. Like in a small amount of number of years, I'm still working in policy, please come and shoot me. Uh, I'm a founder, I'm an investor, this is my background, this is what I want to do. Um, one thing I realized about, uh, the Br uh, about Brussels, uh, the main thing that our job is to speak as a unified voice and ideally break the game. Yes, you need to convince everybody and I agree. But like we can't, like I'm like we all of like our team is like doing this fully voluntary. So ideally it's like the founders of those countries trying to convince and we will create like packages to make this easy, you know. Um, ideally we break the game in multiple other ways. Ideally we manage to create a different, let's say, vibe shift in Europe. Because right now the typical POV that startups has for Europe is that it's not a place for entrepreneurs and innovators. Uh, when I started with startups, which is long ago and I'd like to admit, uh, the common saying was like, when our company becomes big, we have to move to the States, or some of the founders have to move to the States. Nowadays, I meet people who are like early 20s. They don't even know yet what their idea is, but they know that they need to move to the States first before they start working on it. So we are currently at the risk not to only lose this generation, but like to lose the brand of Europe as a whole. And right now, the biggest question we have is like, can we create a certain vibe shift because innovation no longer comes, like innovation to extent comes out of research. And this is where we are strong. We have all the world leading research. But to take the innovation further, that's nowadays happening in big companies. Like AI, like everything that, like the big impacts in AI happened in Matter, happened in OpenAI, in, all, in Google, in all these big companies. The research labs are like the starting point. And this is like one of the biggest fundamental things we need to understand in Europe. It's not only about having you know, our premium life of living. It's not only about all of this. It's like, if we want innovation to actually happen in this continent, we need startups to succeed and there's no way around. And I 
I, for one, hope that we can create a certain vibe shift, not only like among us, but also around Brussels, that they understand that this is like we need a different Europe. It's no longer about like, hey, let's regulate the future of AI when even the investors cannot imagine the future of AI. You know? It's no longer about like this mental exercises about like whatever they're trying to do with that thing. It's about actually fixing Europe for startups, because if we're not, we're becoming a developing nation, a developing continent, 100%. We already are, and it's not only about startups, it's also about scale-ups. I, I would never stay here to grow, I would go to the States, because also, like last commission, uh, Breton gave this big speech is about the digital champions we want in the EU, but then they actually forced this Digital Markets Act, which is an ex-ante regu regulatory tool, so when you grow to be big, we will split you, literally. So Booking.com is now a digital champion from the EU, and now the Commission is investigating them and splitting their business model. So come on, what do you guys want? I would never stay here to grow. And I will address this until the end and hold this new Commission accountable that they cannot propose new regulation. Let's take about the AI Act that came into force 1st of August this year. And the aim was that, you know, we will regulate risk categories on AI. First of all, we are losing this game on AI because you cannot use metadata and traffic data in the EU. We are uh, restricting the use of data. That is something that we need to feed the AI. Putin said 10 years ago, who will win the race in AI will win the globe, right? What you need for the AI is data and that we don't have in the EU, and that worries me. That now we even have more and more regulation restricting use of metadata and traffic data. On AI Act, it says that, please create a regulatory sandbox in all member states. 27 different regulatory sandboxes. I will do my utmost best that Finland creates the best possible regulatory sandbox that, so that our scale-ups can grow and they will not be sanctioned by the Commission. But all member states will do the same. What will happen? This market will be ever more fragmented. So that's why we need this kind of a work that European policymakers will wake up and understand that regulation is not an answer and we need to be also able to say that we went wrong here, we need to deregulate and this needs to happen now. How hopeful are you that that is going to happen? Because I'm sitting here listening to this and I'm and like, this way, sounds like mind. a bit of a mess. It <laughs> will not happen. I'm sorry, it will not happen. I was there standing in these hearings of the new commissioner designates and what I'm hearing is more regulation. When you will become a politician and you want to leave your stamp to the history, what you will do? You will do a Lex Sala, you will do a regulation because then people will rem remember you. And the commission is not wired that way that you will deregulate, but they need to do that. And we need to hold uh, Birkunen and Macron from Ireland accountable that they will not propose new things on Digital Fairness Act that, or whatever is coming. That will be difficult, but that will be part of my job and your job. Um, just as a reminder, I am the uh, politic critical and she's the politician. Okay? <laughs> In case like you're getting confused. I, know. Yeah. Um, I think one thing we need is we need one uh, politician in, in, uh, in Brussels um, to step up and saying like they want to be the commissioner, uh, the president, to act like four startups, period. And that can be, and I don't know who, like, it needs to be a celebrity. It can be Draghi, it can be Van der Leyen or anybody, you know? But this person needs to stand up and say like the next five years about startups and innovation. And AI is a beautiful example. We're talking about like regulation of data and everything. In reality, if I would now fund a startup in uh, Europe for AI, it's very likely that they don't get breakout momentum because it's so hard to fundraise. Let's say they get breakout momentum. Let's say like Mistral, they raised a ton of money, okay? We don't have enough of the data centers to actually train the model. So what they do is they take the money and send it to America. Okay, let's say we built the data centers. We don't even have the, power, the, the electricity, the energy to, to feed them. And the, the problem is here, like, this is no longer like a thing that like, governments like, push. The largest data centers that matter are currently planning are bigger than the largest nuclear reactors that the states have. So what's basically going to happen is that Meta will build a data center and a nuclear reactor. And we, we don't have any companies on that level to compete. So the big question to me is like, how do we increase the momentum of European startups? And if we don't do this now, yeah, welcome to like the near future where we are basically living off a subscription service of the United States, where we get like defense, AI, servers, anything from the States, and we are becoming one of their customers, and that's about it. 
We've given everyone a lot of reasons to be pessimistic. Yeah. In our last minute, was one reason to be optimistic about Europe's startup future? We also have politicians who believe still the startup ecosystem and scale-ups. But the thing is that we need to have this wake-up call for leading politicians in Brussels, and I will be there painting their ass to bring this message. I don't care that I'm a big bad tech uh, lady coming from Meta. I used to work also in the Commission, and I will bring this message because I also know how you will scale up and how you will speed up things. So uh, I will be on your side, but I need you guys to bring me your challenges so we can work together. The, the main reason why I'm optimistic is uh, we have all the billing part. Uh, we have founders with absurd ambition here. We have founders with like absurd research behind them. We have so much ambition in Europe that we're exporting it to the States, like all of above best founders go. We have all the buildings blocks. The main thing that we need to do now is fixing structural issues. And I'm personally very optimistic that um, one thing that we realize is that there's a de determinism to this. If we believe we can improve the society and the world around us, we can actually do it. We just have to act on it. Great. Thank you so much. Sign the petition. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thank you.